Folks, we should be live now. Can somebody whose last name begins with an A tell me if you can hear me so I don't get all these people saying they do? Gotcha. Okay, so uh, this webinar is fairly long. Uh, we've put a lot of work into it, but it's a very complex topic. We try to make it as uh, concise as we possibly can. Uh, hopefully we will not have more people come on than this system will handle, um, but it will be available for viewing afterwards. Um, at the moment, we're just basically making sure that the audio is working for everybody. And as you can see on the, the first slide here, if you can't hear me right now, you can try calling in and getting it through the phone line, but that's limited to 150 people. If there's a problem for anybody, uh, they, this webinar will be posted on the uh, crpa.org forward slash webinars website, uh, along with a number of other webinars. I'm already seeing some questions come up about other topics that aren't going to be covered in this webinar, but that are covered in some of those other webinars. You really ought to have a look at that crpa.org forward slash webinars page and look at the different webinars that we have available there. We have one on loaning, one on 10 plus round magazines, one on um, a, sort of a, a basic one on assault weapon laws, um, so-called, um, and, and a couple of others. They're very helpful. So just stand by for one minute here, and we'll start the actual presentation. Okay, it's noon straight up. Let's get started. We have a lot of people on the line. I'm hoping our system will, will keep up with the capacity. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the webinar. and Thank you for participating. Today we're going to be talking about the new quote-unquote assault weapon regulations, the so-called assault weapon, weapon regulations. Uh, and uh, we are calling this Kamala Harris's nasty goodbye to gun owners because they, it seems that the uh, the folks that wrote these regs really kind of went out of their way to try and make as many things uh, uh, illegal as possible, uh, but I'll, we'll get into that in a moment. Today, uh, my name is Chuck Michelle. I'm the senior partner at Michelle & Associates. Our clients include the National Rifle Association and the California Rifle and Pistol Association. Today's webinar is pr produced by uh, those associations. Uh, I hope that uh, if you're not a member, you'll consider joining both. Uh, Everybody that's on this call, by the fact, by virtue of the fact that you're on the call, it indicates you're interested enough in the subject matter to appreciate uh, some of the things that are happening in California that uh, really are infringing on the rights of gun owners uh, to choose to own a gun to defend themselves or a family. So the first thing that you can do, the best thing that you can do to get involved is to engage by joining these associations, then get plugged in and, and learn about uh, what's going on. We have had some questions about uh, what we do with the, the names of the folks that participate in these webinars. We do not sell these lists. We don't give them to anybody outside of the NRA and the CRPA. You may get some mailings from the CRPA uh, about uh, legal education or legis legislative uh, information that, that tells you what the law does by virtue of the fact that you signed up for this webinar. You've expressed an interest in knowing what the law uh, purports to require, so we figure you're interested in getting that. And uh, you may get, frankly, some calls to take action when and if more ridiculous legislation gets proposed in Sacramento uh, this year, which is 
quite possible we may send you a, shoot you an email asking you to you know call your legislature or take some other action to try and stop some of this stuff from getting any worse uh, I do want to especially welcome the members of the California Department of Justice and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms who are participating on the call today. Uh, you're welcome to hear what we have to say. Uh, I do wish that the folks at DOJ would allow us to participate in the webinars that you put on for FFLs. We tried to register for those and got kicked off for some reason. Uh, so let's do the mutual courtesy of allowing each other to participate in each other's uh, uh, presentations. Today's objectives are to uh, we'll give a quick update on the large capacity magazine regulations and then discuss California Department of Justice's new assault weapon regulations. And so everybody understands the context of these regs, the DOJ attempted to put through large capacity magazine regulations as emergency regulations and thereby uh, avoid going through the normal process for adopting regulations, which is a 45-day public comment hearing, uh, a period, uh, public hearings, and an opportunity for people to weigh in at those. And then the, the, the agency that is promulgating a set of regulations has to actually respond to the comments. Well, there's two ways to avoid that ordinary uh, process for going through the uh, 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 Administrative Procedures Act to, to promulgate executive or administrative regulations that are supposed to flesh out the requirements of a statute. And that's primarily what we're talking about today. There's an assault weapon statute, a law that's in the, that's in the, law, that, that's in the penal code, and then there are regulations that get published in the California Code of Regulations that are supposed to expand on what the statute requires. There are two ways to get around that ordinary public comment process. One is by by uh, adopting the, the regulations as an emergency, and one is if the legislature gives you an exemption from the Administrative Procedures Act. In the case of the large capacity magazine regulations that DOJ put out two days before Christmas, uh, which, was, which made it fun for my staff to, to draft responses and everybody else who submitted responses, they had a five-day window to s send those in. Uh, we we pointed out that there's there's no emergency here. You don't you, you don't qualify for emergency regulations. You have to go through the normal promulgation process. The DOJ withdrew those regulations. We're not sure exactly why. We hope it's because they recognize that it's not an emergency and they have to go through the regular process. But we'll see what they do with respect to the assault weapon regulations. The DOJ is now claiming that they are exempt from the process of, of ordinary Administrative Procedures Act process of putting through regulations and getting public comments because there, an ex there is an exception or ex an exemption in the statute for them for the DOJ to put to out reg assault weapon regulations that deal with the registration of assault weapons. And if, if you saw our alert that went out yesterday from the NRA and CRPA, we sent in a letter to DOJ talking about exactly. Uh, why that exemption does not apply to everything that the assault weapon uh, that these assault weapon regulations purport to do. So we're hopeful that between the OAL and the DOJ, they will understand that this is really uh, they've gone beyond the statutory exemption. They're circumventing, circumventing the regular administrative process, the, what is usually required, by trying to claim that they have this blanket exemption, which really isn't as broad as they're claiming. Uh, I need to put this in there. Forgive me, a lawyer. You know, we have to make this point. There's no attorney-client relationship presented by this seminar, so please don't anybody con uh, confess to some crime in the comments section over there. You're not protected by attorney-client privilege right now. Uh, if you need that kind of specific advice to your specific situation, you have to contact us separately as an individual client. This is again sort of a, an informational webinar uh, that NRA and CRPA were kind enough to uh, fund putting together. Uh, and if you're not a member, you're, you're basically riding the coattails of the, of the membership dues of the folks that are. Uh, but uh, it's not uh, designed to, to, as legal advice to, for any particular person. So just keep that in mind if you have follow-up questions. And we're not going to be able to answer questions on every single We've got a lot of people asking, you know, is my particular gun, make and model XYZ, an assault weapon or not? We can't possibly do that for every single firearm that people are asking about. So what we're trying to do here is give you some guidance on how you figure that out for yourself. If it's too complicated and you can't do that, 
then you contact us uh, separately and we'll help you figure that out. Uh, we'll, we'll keep the fees down as low as we can and, and maybe we can we, – we, we may get some help from the Department of Justice. They're supposed to be putting out an assault weapon identification guide. I should say a new edition of their existing assault weapon identification guide to help show people what's legal and what isn't. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the CRPA is the official state association of the NRA. The CRPA is basically a force multiplier. It's sort of the boots on the ground for, NR for NRA in California, along with the NRA members' councils. Uh, I would suggest that I would ask, frankly. I, I serve as the volunteer, as in pro bono president of the CRPA, and I'd ask everybody to, uh, to join and donate and do what you can, because we will be filing lawsuits uh, against uh, many of these uh, regulations and also the statutes themselves uh, and we could use all the help that you can give us. Every penny that you donate to the NRA or the CRPA in California is spent in California. Uh, the money is not taken out of this state. In fact, that's the way it's been for going back over 20 years. Um, so, you know, if you got a few extra bucks, you could help us out. Here's the, kind of, here's the things that NRA and CRPA do together in California. Uh, and there's more details about this on the CRPA website. Uh, we have reports about some of the lit litigation efforts that we're, that we're engaged in. There's also uh, reports on all these things in every issue of the CRPA Firing Line magazine. Uh, but they're, they're, we're doing everything we can to get more people out to the range pulling triggers, because uh, those people, once they've actually fired a gun and understood what it's all about, they understand how much of what they're hearing on, for the mainstream media is baloney. Uh, and uh, they wind up uh, coming over to our side, and not to mention they have fun. So uh, we're very CRPA and NRA are both very political, but we're also involved in um, in uh, just getting people out shooting. And um, we do we are active on the local level. I can tell you we will be getting more active on the local level. Uh, so please, if you have time, in addition to money, you can uh, volunteer at volunteer at crpa.org. And, uh, and, and help us on, on that level too. So here's, uh, we'll start with the update on large capacity magazines, and I'm actually going to turn this over to, um, to Joe Silvoso, my associate now, who's the head of my regula regulatory compliance practice group, uh, to, to start getting into the nitty gritty of the law here. I see a lot of questions coming up uh, in the sidebar. Uh, we have staff trying to answer as many of those as we can. If we can't get to all of those today, we will try and go through those after the webinar and, and send out a uh, sort of a blanket uh, email kind of answers to FAQs to the extent that that's possible. Uh, we have a lot of people on the call, so uh, we're getting a lot of questions. We're not going to possibly be able to answer every single one of them on the webinar. Uh, and with that, I'll just point out we are now on slide 7 of 59. You can see in the lower right-hand corner how, how, far we're, how fast we're progressing here. I'm trying to guess we're going to try and get through this as quickly as we can. If you run out of time, if you have to drop off, again, that's fine. We will put it, uh, the recorded version of this webinar will be uh, on CRPA's website at crpa.org forward slash webinars. You'll be able to pick up uh, wherever you left off uh, anytime you want on, on that website. So with that, I'll turn this over to Joe. Joe? All right. Hey, guys. Um, good to talk to you again. Sorry it has to be so soon after me talking so long before. Uh, like Chuck said, this is going to be a long one. I'm expecting two hours. So as he said, if you need to get up, move around, dance around, throw things, um, because what I'm going to be saying is problematic, um, go right ahead. Um, I've got a bucket in my office, and we're looking at two hours. So I'm well hydrated, um, got my tea and water, and we're ready to go. Um, it seems like people are having problems with sound. We have an unprecedented number of people participating on this call. Um, some people are talking about losing the audio and getting it back. Bear in mind, um, and I apologize for that, but this is available and will be available through CRPA. Um, and so if you're losing components of the webinar or you can't hear and you want to circle back around, it will be available free of charge on CRPA's website. Um, unedited because the recording we're using here goes directly to the recording, and so we're not having any gaps, any stops um, in the presentation. And thank you for the people confirming that you're getting us loud and clear. I am trying to read the chat as I go through this, um, and so uh, bear with me with that. And some of the questions I've already seen about removing bullet buttons, 
um, 80% and things like that will be addressed down the line. Uh, I won't be able to address raise hands, I'm sorry, because I'm doing a lot of um, juggling right now with things. Um, and actually, let me back up to a slide that we were at previously, if I can. How about what we're going to be talking about today? Um, as the slide I just left mentioned, well, I'll talk briefly about what happened with large cap mags and where we're at. Um, and then going forward, I'll resummarize um, the previous and the past definitions of assault weapons, most of which are still in place. I will then go into the uh, new definition of assault weapon and what that means and what the legislature did um, in defining it. Um, and what they put into place for the registration process, and then we'll dive into the regulations. Um, most of these slides, all 59 of them, have to do with the definitions um, that DOJ put out, keeping in mind that the previous assault weapon uh, definitions that are currently in California law and in the regulations numbered five, a total of five definitions um, the DOJ back in 2000 thought was sufficient to define uh, assault weapon key terms, they've upped that number to 44. And so we'll be spending some time on that, and then we'll be going right into the process of registration. A lot of the requirements are ridiculous requirements that they've created. Um, questions you may have concerning joint registration and inheriting um, assault weapons, we'll touch on those briefly. Um, and of course, modifying assault weapons after registration, we'll touch on that bullet button question that everybody seems to be asking questions about. And then last but not least, deregistering assault weapons. Believe it or not, there exists a way to do that under California law now. Um, and DOJ tweaked that as well with their new um, regulations. And as a result, how to deregister your assault weapon once registered is slightly changed. Um, but going back to where we were before, to give you an update on the large capacity magazine stuff, like Chuck mentioned, after we and a number of other groups um, introduced or provided to OAL and DOJ the uh, letters concerning the emergency regulations and why they won't, were not quote unquote emergencies, DOJ removed their uh, proposal and have yet to resubmit it. But as we mentioned at the bottom of that slide, uh, I expect and we expect uh, the uh, DOJ to resubmit the regulations any day now. Whether or not they're going to try to squeak it in as an emergency again remains to be seen, or they will may actually resubmit it as a full-blown um, standard regulation through the regulation process, allowing for a longer comment period, and uh, whether or not um, and when they do that um, still remains to be seen. So that's the update on large capacity magazines. I don't foresee and we don't foresee the regulations being tweaked all that much, but DOJ could very well decide to make changes pursuant to some of the comments other uh, groups uh, made for the regulations, again, remains to be seen. Um, and that gets us to the all up and stuff, and eight of 59. Um, going back over in the history of the assault weapon laws, of course, these laws uh, regulating assault weapons in their various forms have been on the books in California dating back to the 1990s, um, wherein the legislature decided to adopt the Roberti Roos Assault Weapon Control Act. As a result, uh, a number of firearms were deemed and determined to be assault weapons by their make and model designation. Those firearms were required to be registered back in the 90s. And then, of course, as a result of the Herrett case um, and the problems with quote-unquote series assault weapons, the list of assault weapons expanded, and a number of AKs and ARs were added to the overall list of make and model assault weapons. I won't get into that much further beyond here. However, uh, those lists are still in effect. They are unchanged as a result of these, uh, this new law and the regulations. And so those firearms meeting the make model designation as assault weapons are still considered assault weapons on, under California law. And if you're in possession of those, uh, we need, they needed to be registered um, at their appropriate times. Uh, last but not least, California legislature yet again expanded the definition of an assault weapon uh, back in the early 2000s uh, to, for the category three assault weapons, and that is specifically the feature-based assault weapons going beyond the make model list and determining a firearm to meet the definition of an assault weapon based on the features that firearm possessed. And uh, circa 
2016, way back when, <laughs> um, the definition of assault weapons for rifles, pistols, and shotguns. We'll go over those briefly because they were slightly changed as a result of this new uh, legislation, but it's important to know where we were and where we're at. Um, and so for rifles, there are three ways a rifle could be an assault weapon. If it's a semi-automatic center fire and has the capacity to accept a detachable magazine and one additional feature. So if it has a pistol grip in addition to those features, the thumb hole stock, Folding stock, telescoping stock, forward pistol grip, and the like, uh, a firearm can be, a, a rifle can be an assault weapon for that purpose. Um, as of last year, uh, semi automatic center fire rifles with fixed magazines capable of accepting more than 10 rounds, also assault weapons, and then of course, semi automatic center fire rifles with overall lengths less than 30 inches um, all met the definition of assault weapon as that code section read last year. For pistols, similar, semi-automatic pistols, note that it's not center fire um, required for pistols. Uh, center fire or rim fire pistols can meet the definition of an assault weapon. Uh, nevertheless, semi-automatic pistols with the capacity to accept a detachable magazine and one additional feature, either a barrel, uh, threaded barrel, second-hand grip, a barrel shroud, or detachable magazine outside of the pistol grip. And so semi-automatic pistols with the detachable magazines and one of those additional features uh, were considered assault weapons additionally. Semi-automatic pistols with fixed magazines uh, that had the capacity to accept more than 10 rounds were likewise considered assault weapons as of last year. And then last but not least, um, the shotgun designation, semi-automatic shotguns with both of the following a folding or collapsible stock and a pistol grip, thumb hole stock, and vertical hand grip were considered assault weapons. Uh, Semi-automatic shotguns, uh, able to accept a detachable magazine. Um, and then last but not least, a knee shotgun with a revolving cylinder. Those were considered um, assault weapons all last year. Um, I see some questions relating to what I'm going over here. Um, uh, if those firearms meeting the definition um, of an assault weapon, either through the category one and two, meaning make, model, uh, firearms, or under category three, uh, were possessed in those configurations or have those make, model designations, they already needed to be registered as assault weapons. They are assault weapons when those law passed. And if they are currently, or if you currently own a make, model, assault weapon, or one with a quote unquote detachable a magazine that needed to be registered as an assault weapon uh, prior to the change in those laws, or you have yourself an illegal firearm. Um, the way people came, became compliant with the requirements for the assault weapon restrictions was to include uh, a device commonly known as a, a bullet button because that precluded firearms with detachable magazines from being considered to be detachable, because this was how the law read, at least with respect to the definition of detachable magazine and what the requirements of that feature were. And so in other words, if you had a semi-automatic center fire rifle that did not have a detachable magazine, you could have all of the additional features, which is why people started installing the device commonly referred to as the bullet button. The bullet button allowed you to have a semi-automatic center fire rifle or a semi-automatic pistol and any one of those additional features. Of course, you couldn't have the grenade launcher on it. Uh, but you can have all of those additional features because your rifle or pistol or shotgun uh, wasn't considered to have a detachable magazine because the regulations require that a tool uh, could be used, and if a tool was used to remove the magazine, the magazine was not considered to be detachable. And so because the bullet button requires a tool to remove the magazine, once a bullet button is installed on the firearm, that firearm is not considered to have the capacity to accept a detachable magazine. And so that kind of leads us up to now. What the legislature did was for those two code sections I have highlighted and those two code sections only, they redefined what was, what is, an assault weapon. They struck out the phrase, the capacity to accept a detachable magazine, 
and instead inserted the phrase, does not have a fixed magazine, uh, but has any. And that's basically all they did for purposes of defining or redefining assault weapons. All of the other previous definitions for assault weapons remain. And so we have all of the make model list, those remain, all of, and bear with me as I flip back, the other two definitions you see below for rifles remains unchanged, and the below definition for pistols remains unchanged, and all of the definitions of assault weapon for shotguns remains unchanged in light of the legislature's changes. They only changed and re or modified the definition of assault weapons for two things, semi-automatic center fire rifles that had previously the capacity to accept a detachable magazine, and change that to does not have a fixed magazine and any one of the following, and your semi-automatic pistols that previously stated does not have the capacity to accept a detachable magazine, but now says does not have a fixed magazine. And so all of the other features that would cause the firearm, whether, whether it be a rifle or a pistol, to meet the definition of an assault weapon was unchanged, and all of those other definitions I scrolled back to just now also did not change. And so what the legislature did was, in fact, rather narrow in scope in redefining uh, assault weapon, but of course they did it with one clear goal, which was to close out the definition of or the exception for the bullet button. And in so doing, they decided to define fixed magazine as you see in front of you. An ammunition feeding device contained in or permanently attached to, and I'll touch on those briefly here in a second as well, a firearm in such a manner that the device cannot be removed without disassembly of the firearm action. And of course, what that phrase means before DOJ's regulations came into place was a bit of an area of question because no one knew, or no one still knows, exactly what that phrase is supposed to mean. DOJ does their dawn just to define it, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but nevertheless, the legislature decided to very narrowly define what is a fixed magazine, and in so doing, uh, removed a person's ability to continue to lawfully possess a bullet button firearm because that firearm now meets the definition of an assault weapon and once it does meet the definition of assault weapon through the course of this year will be required to register it with the state of California and again I'll talk about all these requirements uh, these definitions a little bit more in depth as we move forward so what is a person supposed to do this year if they have themselves a bullet button firearm that they acquired last year or the years before that uh, after the law changes. Well, the legislature for the time being put an exception into place for your continued possession of that firearm that as of January 1st is now an assault weapon. And so the exception you see in front of you is, is here. Uh, the person, you, being eligible to register the firearm pursuant to a later code section uh, you lawfully possess that firearm prior to January 1st of this year, and you actually do register that firearm with the California Department of Justice uh, before January 1st, 2018. And so your continued possession of that firearm, which last year, by possessing it with the bullet button, um, and it now being the meeting the definition of an mean and nasty assault weapon, you're going to be able to continue to possess that provided you meet all of those prerequisite requirements for this year. But of course, the last one is you're going to need to register that firearm before January 1st, 2018. And the legislature put into effect or added to a existing code section for the registration of firearms what someone needs to do in registering their firearm as an assault weapon this year. So if you're a person who lawfully possessed a firearm that now meets the definition of an assault weapon from January 1st, 2001 to December 31st, uh, 2016, uh, you will need to sometime this year register that firearm 
as an assault and with the California Department of Justice. And they basically kind of lay it out, at least generally, what the registration requirements are in that code section. You need to do this electronically. No paper registrations will be allowed. Um, and the registration will need to have certain information. Uh, the legislature points out that you'll need to describe the firearm uh, uniquely, indicating all identification marks, uh, the date the firearm was acquired, um, the address individual from whom or business from which the firearm was acquired, and then your personal information, your address, your name, phone number, date of birth, and that information there, which begs the question, at least for the legislature, um, what if you can't remember from whom you got the firearm or their name or their business, or uh, more particularly, if you don't have a California driver's license or a California ID card, will DOJ reject the application? As of right now, right now, I don't know for sure. Um, the legis I'm sorry, the DOJ um, also has some of these requirements and actually even more, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they go beyond that point, but they don't specify if you can't remember or to the best of your ability can't figure out from whom or from where you acquired your firearm. And so whether or not that's terminal to your registration remains to be seen. I would most certainly hope not, um, but that is going to be something we're going to have to review uh, in moving forward. And I see a question concerning active duty military. Um, according to the information from the legislature, um, they don't contemplate active, active duty military. However, DOJ does in the registration process, and I'll touch upon that in a bit. Um, and of course, there is additional concerns because if you've acquired your firearm uh, without going through a licensed firearm dealer and that transaction under California law was inappropriate and DOJ is trying to compel you to provide that information before registering your assault weapon, you are in a bit of a sticky situation because if you get your gun from Pookie down the street on the street corner and it now meets the definition of an assault weapon, well, I would certainly hope you wouldn't provide that information uh, to the California Department of Justice. If you have any concerns about the acquisition of your firearm um, or how to fill out this form, you should probably discuss this with a attorney and uh, we can walk you through that process later on. Um, there are no, I'm sorry to say, law enforcement exceptions to uh, these registration requirements. Law enforcement, if you acquired a bullet buttoned firearm, you're going to have to go through the registration process just like everybody else. Um, I will be also discussing inheriting these firearms uh, later on as well. Um, so we'll talk about all of that stuff in moving forward um, too. And I see multiple questions coming through. I also see there's additional issues concerning the audio and again, um, if the audio cut, uh, cuts out on you, um, we are probably at or exceeding the capacity uh, for our system. Um, and so if the audio is cutting in and out, again, I apologize, but um, uh, these will be available later on on the CRPA website. Um, a little bit more uh, from the legislature, at least. You're going to need to pay 15 bucks for registration, and you're going to have to do that with a debit or credit card. Uh, online and uh, note that the legislature says that the department may charge up to $15 um, and as I joked in the past if you listen to me to give this lecture before I fully expected them to say that $15 was the required amount uh, that <laughs> is what they've decided to do uh, they'll decide to go for the whole shebang and ding you for the 15 bucks uh, of course to be paid electronically and so you've got to do it through the debit or credit card, uh, no sending a check or um, cash order through the mail. And then last but not least, as Chuck already mentioned, uh, DOJ is required to come up with regulations. However, it's for purposes of implementing that section only, which has to do with the registration. So all of the process I mentioned in those last two slides relating to registration of assault weapons, uh, that's all they're allowed to do. And as our letter points out that we submitted yesterday, as I will do as we move forward, um, what they've done and what they're doing far exceeds the registration process. And so uh, the issue here being is how far can DOJ go, how far can they push this registration process, we dare argue uh, not very far, um, and we'll point out the problems both with their confusing 
uh, uh, regulations that they've proposed in addition to them far exceeding the registration process. And so that brings us to today. And so as you all may probably know, um, DOJ filed their regulations with the OAL on December 30th. Uh, they are currently being reviewed uh, by OAL. You can actually go to the OAL, OAL website um, and you can see the regulations under review. These regulations are referenced there, although they're not reprinted there. OAL has a deadline uh, they posted of February 13th uh, for them to go over the regulations, but this is not, like Chuck said, the standard APA process in which you have a public comment period. Uh, when DOJ, or at least when the legislature, gives an agency an exception to the APA process, uh, they may go ahead and directly create these regulations and they become a law. But as we mentioned before, these regulations should and only should relate to the registration of assaultants and shouldn't go beyond that point. But nevertheless, once an APA exception is um, put in place for the agency, uh, they don't have to go through the public comment period for that exception and those regulations. And so yesterday uh, we provided a letter to both OAL and DOJ saying, hey, not only do these laws in a lot of cases make no sense, um, and they go beyond what's allowed in the law already, but they also go beyond the scope of the APA exception and they go beyond just registering assaultants. They redefine firearms to meet the definition of assault weapons. They greatly expand the scope of registration um, of certain firearms, and as a result, a lot of these regulations should be problematic. Where DOJ and OAL goes from here remains to be seen, uh, but keep in mind that we and uh, the other attorneys in our office are well prepared uh, no matter what direction either DOJ and, or OAL goes with these regulations to oppose them, um, draw attention to them, and potentially challenge them if and when needed. And so um, in putting this together today, uh, there have been a number of attorneys in our office already and currently hard at work at the next phase of this. But right now, we've launched that letter. We're going to put the ball in OAL and DOJ's court. I hope they act appropriately. Um, and we will see where things go for there. Um, and I apologize, I don't think I mentioned what OAL is. OAL is the Office of Administrative Law. Um, they are basically, for lack of a better term, the clearinghouse uh, for the regulations that agencies propose. Um, OAL um, will receive the regulations, they will review them, they will do analysis. They're kind of the gatekeepers, for lack of a better term, um, uh, of regulations to make sure the agencies proposing them have done everything that they're required to do, to make sure the regulations pass the snuff uh, with what they're allowed to do. And then if all of the hurdles have been jumped over, the T's have been crossed, the I's have been dotted by the agency, they then submit them to the Secretary of State for publication in the California Code of Regulations as California's laws. And so they are, the regs that I'm talking about now, and will be probably for the next hour and a half, um, are with OAL right now, and um, they are not the law yet. The laws that the legislature passed, the ones I've just spoke upon, uh, those are California law as of January 1st. The regulations I'll be speaking about here uh, is the regulations are the regulations that DOJ has proposed. They are not the law as of yet. And so what remains to be seen again is in DOJ's and OAL's hands, but depending on what that outcome is, we are uh, very prepared to pursue any and all legal remedies uh, that we may deem fit. Um, and I think there was another question concerning the APA. Um, I'm using that abbreviation as well as I apologize. Um, that's the Administrative Procedures Act. That's basically the rules. Um, a a department or a, a agency needs to follow in creating, uh, proposing, and promulgating regulations. And so they, the APA is the rules that departments need to follow in creating regulations, and the OAL is, for lack of a better term, the enforcement agency. I think I've called them the, <laughs> I've called them the gatekeepers, uh, the enforcement agency, and something else. 
Uh, my metaphors have been multiply uh, mixed as of today. Uh, but nevertheless, that's kind of an overview of the process and where we're at right now. And so, like I said before, um, there are a number of problems with the DOJ's regulations. They expand the scope of what is considered an assault weapon. They create ex or exceed with the requirements in the penal code or what the code allows them to do. And then, of course, they've created a number of vague and problematic definitions that anybody um, has a hard time understanding, uh, let alone even me, uh, an attorney who, for all intents and purposes, is well versed in these laws. And so what DOJ has done, and I'm sorry to say is rather childish in their approach, they decided to title every single one of these sections, Registration of Assault Weapons Pursuant to Penal Code Section 30900B1, as if calling it that um, would cause OAL to just simply, or anybody else, to rubber stamp them because clearly they have to do with registration because DOJ is calling them that. And they call them that for every single code section uh, that DOJ is proposing. Um, but nevertheless, here's the list of the regulations uh, that DOJ is proposing. Like I said, we'll talk about almost all of them in some detail or another. Um, the biggest one is going to be um, 5471. That's the definitions code section um, as it relates to um, a lot of the terms, although not all of the terms DOJ uses um, in classifying or reclassifying firearms as a assault weapon. Uh, that is by far the biggest code section that they've added, um, but nevertheless, it's going to take a lot of our time. And so uh, what DOJ has done has, is tried to classify, as the title suggests, which weapons must be registered um, under these new laws. And they basically classify three. Um, they basically essentially say that except for registration section, or sorry, regulation section uh, 5472, which I'll talk about later, are those firearms that do not need to be registered or will not be registered. Um, any quote unquote assault weapons that does not have a fixed magazine must be registered by January 1st, 2018. So note there it says assault weapons that do not have fixed magazines. If your firearm is not a quote-unquote assault weapon, it will not need to be registered um, by January 1st, 2018. The second part of this is by far, as far as I'm concerned, the most troubling because DOJ also claims that any semi-automatic center firearm, center fire firearm, um, be it a rifle, pistol, or shotgun uh, that has, for lack of a better paraphrase, a bullet button and one other specific feature must be registered. And as I've mentioned before, and I tried to emphasize before, the legislature did not change or modify the definition of assault weapon for shotguns. It's not there. They did redefine what constitutes an assault weapon for rifles, and that was changing the capacity to accept a detachable magazine to fixed magazine. I'm sorry, I should better say does not have a fixed magazine. And for pistols, the same thing. They removed capacity to accept a detachable magazine and replaced it with does not have a fixed magazine. And that was all they did. They did not touch, did not remodify, um, did not redefine any of the restrictions for shotguns. But lo and behold, we see shotguns uh, being mentioned. And not only that, it seems to appear that DOJ is insisting that shotguns be registered as assault weapons if they have a bullet button, or at least here, uh, one specific feature that identifies, that is identified in the penal code um, that must be included as well. And so it would appear, and this is one of those vague terms that we point out in our letter, it would appear, at least in this regulation, that for a assault weapon, a semi-automatic centerfire shotgun with a bullet button and one additional feature must be registered. But that's not the requirement, and that's not how the code section defines detachable magazine shotguns as assault weapons. Just semi-automatic shotguns uh, with detachable magazines or the ability to accept a detachable magazine is all that's required. And so the second definition or the second requirement appears to either be vague or 
expand the registration requirement where the legislature did not intend it. Um, and so that is something most certainly we've pointed out in detail in our letter. I will mention it again later on because it's rears his head um, two slides from now. Um, but last but not least, and that third bullet point has caused some confusion, I'm aware, um, and it specifies that semi-automatic uh, rimfire pistols with bullet buttons and one or more features specified in the code section must be registered. And the rimfire has uh, thrown people off, but as I mentioned before, uh, with respect to semi-automatic pistols, they don't differentiate between center fire or rim fire. Any semi-automatic pistol that does not have a fixed magazine, be it center fire or rim fire, um, that does not have a fixed magazine in one of those previously uh, mentioned uh, uh, features um, is an assault weapon. And so people had thought and that had questions in the past saying that they're uh, illegally exceeding their scope of the definition of assault weapon for purposes of pistols, and unfortunately that's not the case. Um, unlike rifles uh, that require the firearm to be center fire before it can be considered an assault weapon under its uh, features-based designation. Uh, for pistols, center fire or rim fire can be an assault weapon if it has uh, the prohibited features. Um, but we'll talk about all of this stuff a little bit more later. And as I mentioned before, uh, the previous code section that defined a lot of these key terms had five. There were five definitions. There are still five definitions because of that code section I say right there, uh, 5469, is still in effect. Um, it hasn't been preempted. It hasn't been removed um, by DOJ's um, proposed regulations. It's still the law as of January 1st, um, 2017. Uh, what DOJ is going to be doing, though, is greatly expanding the scope of its definitions through uh, that through this so-called exception to the register, the exception to the APA for registration, to 44 definitions. And like I said before, we're going to be talking about a lot of them. We will not be talking about all of them. Um, only those ones pertinent to uh, this. Uh, discussion and analysis. You're more than welcome to go ahead and review the full uh, scope of the definitions as they're in the regulations. Uh, but turning to the one, and probably again, one of the ones that's the biggest area of concern is this one that's right in front of you. Um, as I mentioned before, a semi-automatic shotgun that has the ability to accept a detachable magazine is considered an assault weapon. And in the past, um, manufacturers of shotguns that did have a detachable magazine would install a bullet button into that shotgun. Therefore, and once the bullet button was installed, the shotgun did not have a detachable magazine and therefore was eligible to be possessed under California law. And as I mentioned before again, the legislature did not change that definition of assault weapon for shotguns. But right here, it's apparent that DOJ is trying to of their own accord because in redefining the ability to accept a detachable magazine, DOJ is defining that term to require that the shotgun has a fixed magazine. Or in other words, if you have a semi-automatic center fire, I'm sorry, semi-automatic shotgun that does not have a fixed magazine, it's considered an assault weapon. So those in possession of a bullet-buttoned shotgun would need to register their firearm as an assault weapon this year, not because of a change in the law by the legislature, but by a change in the law by the California Department of Justice for shotguns. And so that is, a, I think, one of the biggest areas of concern. Uh, that we are facing when it comes to this registration and these registration requirements is that DOJ of its own accord outside of uh, the legislature's um, changes to the law have expanded the definition of assault weapons to meet, uh, to include a bullet button shotguns. Uh, barrel length, it's a rather long definition. Uh, the question, of course, in our minds uh, with respect to barrel length is that uh, what this has to do with registering assault weapons. 
um, because as you may or may not be aware, barrel length has very little to do uh, with whether or not a firearm meets the definition of an assault weapon. In fact, barrel length has nothing to do uh, with the definition of a solipin under California law, it's overall length. And um, the other issue here being is that barrel length only really rears its head when we're talking about things like short barrel rifles and shotguns. Those aren't assault weapons. Uh, they're defined in a different code section, and you're most certainly not going to be able to register your short barrel rifle or shotgun um, as an assault weapon this coming year because the registration is only open to assault weapons. So why DOJ is deciding to go this route uh, remains to be seen, uh, but nevertheless, they decided to define barrel length uh, for purposes of these regulations. Um, the detachable magazine definition, as it's currently in the code, um, is also reprinted by DOJ, and it appears in these new regulations as well. Um, it's slightly modified from what it is in the code, um, but the three lower bullet points are of um, of concern, uh, or at least of note. Um, we had in the past people who had been arrested and charged for possessing an assault weapon with a magnet or some other device inserted into their bullet buttoned firearm. And uh, California Department of Justice evidently wants to make it aware, or at least apparent, um, that leaving a magnet inside the bullet button will constitute a detachable magazine. Um, if the firearm has a detachable magazine, it is most certainly not fixed, as uh, that phrase is now the required one. Um, as a result, it probably will meet the definition of a assault weapon if you're leaving something in your bullet button or in uh, the magazine release mechanism that allows you to release the magazine with by simply pushing the, um, the device. Um, additionally, lacking a, a magazine uh, catch assembly. Um, it had also been a question whether or not if your magazine can be inserted into the firearm and there is no catch, meaning you push the magazine in and it falls right back out, whether or not that would be considered a, a detachable magazine um, or whether or not it would be considered a uh, a well, have the ability to accept any type of magazine uh, because or if the magazine were just to fall out. And yes, I noticed that it's a searing <laughs> and magazine release that should be catch spring and magazine release. I apologize for the typo. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, but nevertheless, um, for AR-15s and AK-47s, if they don't have um, a magazine catch assembly, meaning that if you push the magazine in and it falls right back out, the DOJ is defining those as detachable magazines as well. Again, because the requirement is now fixed magazine, um, those firearms can also be problematic uh, for purposes of uh, the assault weapon designation. Disassembly of the firearm action, and trust me guys, I, I see the, the chat going through. I get every single one of these questions. Um, this is by far the most commonly asked question, so I hope you rejoice appropriately now that we're on this topic. Um, DOJ did define disassembly of the action for purposes of what is a fixed magazine in the regulations, and they've done it thus, and it's in front of you right now. Um, and as you recall, a firearm will meet the definition of an assault weapon if it's a rifle, if it's semi-automatic, center fire, it does not have a fixed magazine, and one or more of those mean nasty features. Pistols, similarly, semi-automatic, without a fixed magazine, and one or more of those other mean nasty features. And what does a fixed magazine mean? It's a magazine that is, con is contained in or permanently attached to the firearm uh, so as to, uh, in order to remove it, require you to disassemble the f act firearm action. And here's what we have for purposes of that disassembly of the firearm action phrase. Um, the action has to be interrupted and will not function. And DOJ specifies for purposes of this definition, a disassembly of an action for a two-part receiver like an AR-15 uh, would require the rear takedown pin to be removed from the upper and lifted upwards and away from the lower receiver and using the front pivot pin 
as the fulcrum before the magazine can be removed. And so a lot of people are asking about those brand new type of bullet buttons that require you to flip up the upper receiver in order and before you can remove the magazine. Based on this definition, those bullet buttons, the new versions of the bullet buttons, or whatever they're being called um, by the other manufacturers who are proposing them, all of these devices that replace the standard magazine release mechanism and require you before the magazine can be released to open or pivot up your upper receiver in an AR type firearm, those would be considered fixed magazines. And so in this instance, they would and cause your firearm to be quote unquote California compliant um, based on the installation of those. And so that I know was a large area of concern. And thank you to other people pointing out the AR mag lock um, and the Patria button. Again, all of those work under the same or similar fashion. They have a arm or restriction. Uh, that prevents you from leasing the magazine while the firearm fire is fully assembled. But once you remove that rear takedown pin and prop, or um, I should say pivot, the upper receiver up on that front takedown pin, your action is quote unquote disassembled. And as a result, um, that firearm should be considered to have a fixed magazine for purposes of the assault weapon restriction. So if you want to, and if you're thinking about having a firearm, um, that currently has a bullet button for it, at least in the AR platform, replacing the current bullet button uh, with the new remodified bullet button that requires you to pop up that upper receiver should suffice for purposes of these new restrictions. Of course, we always have the X factor of the legislature wanting to do whatever the heck they want to do later on. Uh, and changing these definitions, modifying these definitions at another date. We know people from Sacramento um, and the writers of some of these laws are listening right now. Um, so what this will be at the end of the day remains to be seen, but nevertheless, DOJ is providing um, us that information that those devices that require you to pop up the upper receiver before the magazine can be released should suffice as a quote-unquote fixed magazine. And so. Um, those of you asking all of those questions uh, prior to this point, uh, rejoice, uh, and <laughs> let's move on. Just to, um, just to quickly put a, part, a little bit of a point on that, Joe. Folks, there are different variations of those aftermarket uh, modification kits, and depending on the specifics of how they work and whether or not they uh, somehow might be construed to enable the firearm to work with a conventional detachable magazine, uh, if uh, uh, depending on you know what happens when you pivot the upper back onto the lower without the uh, without the without a magazine in it, uh, th th they could be problematic. So really, this this may require looking at each individual product to make sure uh, that it's not going to be considered some kind of, a, of an illegal conversion kit, uh, and that it's uh, converting it to a um, a, a uh, something that's compliant. So you've got to be a little bit careful. We can't predict all the different ways these aftermarket products could be uh, configured, uh, and but we'll put something more out on that as we start to look at those. Uh, and I expect hopefully the DOJ will put out an assault weapon identification guide or an, a, a new edition of their assault weapon identification guide, which will explain some of that uh, and, and what they see as problematic with some of those specific types of, of conversion kits. So just Thanks, proceed Dr. with some caution. Yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've seen some uh, um, other devices or some other claims uh, with respect to devices um, being 100% um, okay under California laws. You've got to be very careful with all of those uh, devices and look out for those. Um, I think I'll address it here as I don't think I have a very good place later on to do that. Um, there is reference and there are been a number of questions relating to what uh, featureless builds and firearms uh, not being considered assault weapons. 
Um, if you were to remove the features, and by that I mean uh, the mean nasty characteristics that would cause the firearm to be considered an assault weapon, mean nasty characteristics like a pistol grip or a folding or collapsible stock. Um, the featureless bill, despite the fact that the DOJ did a rather and really poor job of defining quote unquote featureless, uh, those builds should still be suffice. And so even if you still have your semi-automatic centerfire rifle with a full-blown detachable magazine, uh, you should still be able to possess that firearm provided it doesn't have any of those other mean nasty features like a pistol grip or forward pistol grip um, or a folding collapsible stock or case in point a flash suppressor but as that term is now defined uh, which segues me pretty good into flash suppressor um, this, and keeping in mind, in addition to working for Chuck and the regulatory compliance things, I also handle uh, the criminal defense work here at the office. Um, and this phrase has always been one that I've been wanting to keep in my back pocket because it was horribly written the first time it was defined. And it appears to have gotten, if anything, worse in DOJ redefining it because what this phrase means what devices actually do this is still an area of debate and up in the air. And DOJ didn't do us any additional favors by extending the definition. And so the current and the previous definition was just basically that first sentence there. It means any attached uh, device attached to the end of the barrel, although they decided to say it needed to be attached to the end of the barrel and not sunglasses. Um, designed, intended, or functions to perceptibly reduce or redirect the muzzle flash out of the shooter's field of vision. That for more or less has been the previous, and I dare I say, also vague version of this definition that was in the books before, but it's gotten worse because it appears that DOJ will now consider a device to be a flash suppressor if it's advertised as, as, flash, and as to have flash suppressing properties, which I don't know exactly what that means, um, or functionally has flash suppressing properties are deemed to be flash suppressors. What those phrases mean and uh, what the application of those phrases are yet still remains to be seen. And so we point this out in our letter. Um, and if you want to go into detail, uh, by all means, go ahead and review that. Um, but it doesn't stop there because if a manufacturer labels or identifies a device as a flash suppressor, it's considered a flash suppressor. Um, that's potentially problematic as well because if a manufacturer were to call a rifle a bazooka, it doesn't make it a destructive device. And so why and what uh, cause a law enforcement agency or a prosecutor would have in saying something is an illegal device just because someone calls it that device uh, remains to be seen. Because if the device doesn't have those properties to reduce uh, the muzzle flash or redirect it out of the shooter's field of vision, well then it shouldn't be a flash suppressor. It should not be a flash suppressor based on just what somebody calls it in their brochure or their manual, but nevertheless, this is what DOJ is going to try to expand the definition of a flash suppressor to include. And so most certainly this is something we are going to, <laughs> to uh, mention. Um, and yes, uh, if, you, if you wanted to call it your flash enhancer, um, that <laughs> might be a good way to go about it. Um, I say that tongue in cheek, and please don't do that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Yes, uh, the, uh, what DOJ is doing here um, is a, a bit transparent as far as I'm concerned because I know through my criminal defense work, a lot of law enforcement will uh, refer back to the manual when they flat out don't know what a muzzle attachment is. And uh, if in a lot of cases, I've seen law enforcement go, well, the manufacturer calls it a flash suppressor, it must be a flash suppressor, equals assault weapon. And I've had to explain to district attorneys, well, no, that's not the case, unless these guys have taken it out and have shot it in the middle of the night and see it reduce uh, the flash or redirect the flash out of the shooter shooter's field of vision. And again, what that is still remains to be seen. 
um, they don't have themselves a flash suppressor. Uh, but DOJ is trying to to go the easy route and just say, if a manufacturer calls it a flash suppressor, that's good enough for us. And that's not good enough for us. And, and that's certainly something we're going to be pushing if these things go forward. Um, uh, but moving forward, this has been, and this definition um, has been an area of concern because I know a lot of you out there have been coming up with actually rather ingenious ways uh, to attach, or permanently attach, I should say, uh, your magazines to your firearms so they will be considered fixed and therefore not have to be registered as assault weapons. Uh, but nevertheless, the DOJ has decided to do you one better and to tell you what permanently attaching your magazine to your firearm means. And so I know a lot of people have or at least contemplated modifying their magazine release or um, doing something with their magazine release that would prevent it from working, and so therefore the magazine could not be removed from the firearm. That, as far as I was concerned, before I saw this definition, should have sufficed under California law. Um, but nevertheless, what DOJ is doing here is telling us what permanently attaching the magazine to the firearm means, and specifically that information in red. You're going to need to weld, epoxy, or rivet that magazine uh, to the magazine well. And so modifying or preventing the bullet button from functioning, that's, for lack of a better term, permanently locking your firearm into place, uh, would not suffice um, for purposes of this definition. And as a result, unless that magazine is welded, epoxy, or riveted into place, uh, you're going to have a, hard, or a bit of a hard time saying that your magazine is permanently attached to the firearm. Again, I have a substantial problems with that, and as far as I would be concerned, if there wasn't a definition of this, um, fixing or modifying your magazine release mechanism so that the fire, I'm sorry, the magazine could not be released should suffice. Um, but DOJ, unfortunately, seems to be going us one better. Um, I do see a couple of questions, have seen a couple of questions relating to muzzle brakes. Um, uh, truth be told, I, I could not say whether or not something is a muzzle brake or for certain a flash suppressor just by uh, looking at it or, um, uh, or uh, it being explained to me what it does without seeing it and either, even technically um, determining whether or not it perceptively reduces the amount of muzzle, muzzle flash or redirects it out of the shooter's field of vision. I would expect and hope that the muzzle attachments that are currently marketed as muzzle brakes will be continued to be able to be done so, um, but that still remains to be seen in light of this new definition. And again, the, bit, the ball is a bit in DOJ's court concerning what they're going to do with this new rather ridiculous definition of flash suppressor and where and how uh, devices that, for all intents and purposes, do function and are functionally muzzle brakes um, are, are continue to be owned and possessed and used. Um, I do I think we saw a, uh, a couple of questions relating to the overall length requirements, um, and they are um, posted here. Again, we point these out, again, because they have nothing to do with fixed magazine, whether or not a rifle is an assault weapon due to its overall length that was unaffected by the changes uh, by the legislature in California law and as a result um, should not have changed at all. But nevertheless, we see a new definition or a, a new definition for what constitutes an overall length of less than 30 inches. Again, this requirement or I should say restriction uh, wasn't affected by the new laws, should not be changed, and as a result, uh, why this definition is here included by DOJ is a little bit questionable. Um, <laughs> unfinished receiver, I, I, I do credit DOJ for attempting to make a definition for unfinished or I dare say 80% receiver, um, and I point this out here partly because it's so poorly written other than going into it, and I'm not going to go into it to full detail because uh, the, the number of threads that are left dangling um, that are, are questionable here um, are so numerous, I could spend another 15, 20 minutes on just this slide alone. Um, 
but nevertheless, yeah, this is just in yet another prime example of the problems DOJ has had in creating these regulations. Uh, I do credit them in attempting and making a yeoman's effort in doing so. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this is, uh, wow, uh, when it comes to uh, an unclear or vague definition. Uh, Semi-automatic. Um, this is a rather interesting inclusion, um, and it does open up some uh, possibilities when it comes to possession of firearms and what is considered an assault weapon, keeping in mind for almost all intents and purposes, unless you have a shotgun with a revolving cylinder, in order to be an assault weapon, one of the prerequisite requirements is that firearm is semi-automatic. If the firearm is not semi-automatic, it cannot be an assault weapon for any of the feature designations, and I dare say that would extend to the make model designations because the definition of those um, firearms also reference the firearm being semi-automatic. Um, and so defining what is semi-automatic, um, DOJ basically points out that if a part or a um, piece of that firearm is lacking, uh, that does, call, the, does not allow that firearm to function, uh, such as a, the pin, of the bolt carrier, the, the gas tube, or other crucial part of the firearm, um, it is not considered semi-automatic. In other words, if your firearm is broken, missing a, a key component, has a key component removed, it should not be considered semi-automatic and should not be considered an assault weapon. Likewise, and they mentioned before, and they mentioned it below, I should say, if the upper receiver and the complete lower receiver are completely detached from one another and still in possession and custody control of the same person, it is not a semi-automatic firearm, which is well, kind of obvious because the firearm one doesn't function, but it also, it also helps a lot of our firearm dealers who often sell the lower receiver in one portion of their store and the upper receiver in another. Uh, a, a, a devious or a clever law enforcement officer would say potentially, hey, you have all the parts of an assault weapon, you should be able to be prosecuted for possession of assault weapon. But no, if the firearm doesn't function, and in this case not put together, it's still not considered an a, a assault weapon because it's not semi-automatic. But keep in mind, and I'll go in reverse order, I'll go up one, if you just have a trigger lock or a gun lock on that firearm, but if it is all present and operable, but for the gun lock or the um, trigger lock uh, being attached to the firearm, that firearm is still semi-automatic. Likewise, um, if it just is missing ammunition and a magazine, also would be considered semi-automatic. So um, bear that in mind in moving forward that one, Firearms, in order to be assault weapons, need to be semi-automatic, and if a firearm cannot or does not function, um, it should not be considered semi-automatic as well. Uh, threaded barrel. Uh, again, law, DOJ decides to go one step beyond what would previously be considered, um, I would consider a threaded barrel, to what a lot of people have been and have been doing to make their firearms California compliant. And in most cases, um, in a lot of cases, when they've had or come across a threaded barrel, a lot of firearm owners have either welded or permanently attached some type of device, whether or not it's a flash suppressor or a forward grip or a silencer, although I wouldn't put a silencer or have a silencer in the city of California, um, on those barrel threads, thus covering up and uh, permanently removing, as far as I would be concerned, those barrel threads uh, from the firearm. Um, DOJ appears to say that even if you have something covering up or um, permanently attached to uh, that firearm to cover those barrel threads, uh, they may still be considered threads for purposes of the threaded barrel restriction. That is, as far as I'm concerned, almost nonsensical. Um, but nevertheless, that appears to be what they're trying to say, that when you have a threaded barrel able to accept a uh, flash suppressor for a pistol grip or a silencer and includes a threaded barrel with any one of those features already mounted on it, uh, I would still have a hard time saying that that firearm has a threaded barrel, um, but it appears that DOJ is saying that with one of those devices attached to it, even if it's 
I dare say, welded or loctited on is still considered to have a threaded barrel. Um, that is a potential problem because if the, anybody here remembers the Walther P22 and uh, the problems that DOJ had in accepting that gun for sale in the state of California and then realizing it had barrel threads um, and the retrofit of that firearm to cover up and remove that feature, uh, they may be reopening or opening the door again to that problem. And so what DOJ means here and what DOJ is doing to say whether or not a pistol has barrel threads, even if you have something mounted on it, um, remains to be seen. And I, again, I dare say a, is a rather and remains a rather vague and unclear regulation. And so that also... And yes, this is only for pistols, the barrel, the threaded barrel restriction and requirement. Um, and yeah, I, I see a couple of questions to those, and I apologize if I wasn't clear with that. Um, the threaded barrel feature is one uh, that's limited to pistols. Rifles may have threaded barrels and not meet the definition of a solid weapon, of course, which you put on those threaded barrels potentially be uh, problematic, of course, if it has, if it's considered a flash suppressor or has those flash suppressing uh, properties. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, that is also a, a an area of concern. Okay, now that we've plowed, I dare say, through the uh, definitions, we're getting to the actual registration requirements, or more particularly as DOJ uh, points them out, what cannot be registration, uh, a registered as a solipens. Uh And so in moving forward, DOJ points out a number of firearms that will not be accepted or registered as assault weapons. Uh, those firearms sold after January 1, 2017, as you probably are all aware. Um, DOJ, in their previous frequently asked questions, put great onus on firearm dealers and the public to be in possession of their firearms, meaning the new definition of assault weapons before January 1, 2017. Well, there's a bit of a problem. DOJ has expanded the definition of assault weapons to heights unforeseen as of last year. And I dare say there are firearms that meet the, the new definition of assault weapons, at least to how DOJ defines them, that were sold after January 1, 2017. What and how that's going to be affected by these regulations uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but nevertheless, there is that area of concern with DOJ futzing with the new definition of assault weapons and taking it beyond what was previously considered before January 1, 2017, those who acquired these firearms after that point, um, whether or not they're going to be able to register them uh, remains an area of concern. I do remember seeing, and um, there are other people who had asked questions about firearms that were previously registered as assault weapons um, or previously possessed meeting the definition of the old versions of assault weapons. Those need to be um, ha or have been registered prior to this year. And my biggest area of concern for a lot of people in the state of California is that they still don't understand fully these ridiculous and cumbersome laws and as a result may still try to register thinking there's a time for them to do this or potentially even an amnesty in effect um, for them to do this and register those firearms that are make model prohibited. I know and I fear that it's going to happen and the bigger fear I have is once they submit that information, um, DOJ might come a knocking. Um, but nevertheless, uh, DOJ has flat out said they will not register firearms meeting the old definitions or needed to be registered prior to this year. Um, so if you have cat ones and twos, uh, please contact an attorney uh, immediately relating to what you should do with those firearms. Uh, firearms meaning the definition of assault and prior to this year um, should also be uh, addressed before you try to register it this year. If you have questions, please ask those before providing the information to DOJ because our concern is not just the rejection of those registrations, um, but local law enforcement or California Department of Justice coming knocking on your door. 
Um, there were questions, and I mentioned them briefly, uh, briefly about quote unquote featureless firearms. As I mentioned before, the definition, why well, I didn't go over it here, a featureless is a rather poor one, but I dare say if you have a firearm that does not, based on its features, meet the new definition of assault weapon, you will not need to register it. And so if you have a semi-automatic centerfire rifle, even with a detachable magazine one, and none of those mean nasty features, um, you would not need to register it as, assault, as an assault weapon. And um, I saw the question presented, and I don't have a slide for it, but it is a common one, also, and so I'll address it here. Um, uh, someone pointed out that when you acquired your firearm um, sometime in the past, it may have been registered uh, to the California Department of Justice in the automated firearm system as a firearm registered to you. And I need to be very clear in this point in that just because the firearm is registered to you when you acquired it does not mean that it is a registered assault weapon to you. This is a separate process that you will need to go through if you choose to register your firearm as an assault weapon this coming year um, to be able to continue to lawfully own and possess that firearm. And so in this instance, despite the fact that California Department of Justice may already know that you have this firearm in the system, um, you will be required to register the firearm. I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback here. Hold on half a second. Okay, I think that was dealt with. Um, I think that was, correct me if I'm wrong, Chad, was that Ali McBeal or was that, um, um, was that LA Law? <laughs> yes, and it was rather horrible. Oh, it was Boston Legal. There we go. <laughs> um, I don't know where, that is actually um, our office's hold tone, and I don't know if we got cross-referenced or we got a change in the line. Um, Chad, if you can hear me, just say, hey, Joe, we can hear you, and I'll move on. Um, uh, but, yeah, I think that was <laughs> – yeah, and there's one person in the chat saying that was DOJ trying to put an end to our webinar. Uh, that may very well be the, uh, be the case. Um, and so I'm moving on. Thanks for the confirmation, guys. Uh, moving on, uh, we left off with feature list. Again, um, uh, what, if it, the firearm has a fixed magazine and holds 10 rounds or less, that is obviously um, uh, not an assault weapon. If the firearm doesn't have any of the prohibited features, and so therefore that firearm would not need to be registered. Um, if the firearm is not fully assembled or and fully functioning, like I mentioned before, if the firearm is disassembled, it's not semi-automatic, and so at that point, it's not considered an assault weapon and not something that needs to be registered as of yet. However, that firearm was fully assembled, of course, and it has all the meat and nasty features. Um, it would need to be registered as a assault weapon. Uh, and, but the last two are, are areas of concern. Uh, firearms manufactured by a federally licensed manufacturer, if the firearm does not have a serial number, it will not be registered by DOJ. Moreover, if the firearm was manufactured by somebody other uh, than a, a licensed manufacturer that does not have a serial number, which is typically 80%, and yes, bear with me, guys, I have seen your questions relating to the 80% and the stamping requirement, and I'll talk about those soon. Um, but nevertheless, if you have made up your own firearm that now meets the definition of an assault weapon, um, and you will need to go through a separate process according to California Department of Justice to both acquire the serial number and then and put that on the firearm and put other information onto the firearm um, uh, before it will be and accepted to be registered by California Department of Justice. And to address the first one, DOJ provided zero information about how and the process to register firearms um, that uh, were manufactured by a licensed firearm dealer, yet they do not possess the serial number. Um, I'm sure that some of those firearms still um, exist out there, but nevertheless, um, the process to do that is undefined by California Department of Justice when the, the firearm was made by a manufacturer um, that did not have a serial number. 
Um, but I will touch on um, uh, but the 80 percent issue here in a second because there is a full um, set of requirements that DOJ is going to make you go through to get the serial number and put that onto your firearm prior to them accepting the registration. Uh, as for the application process, if you choose to register your firearm um, as it's now falls under the new definition of assault weapon, you're going to need to log into the California Department of Justice's website uh, under that address for the CFARS system um, and create an account. But in making that account, the regulations require you to agree to a number of waivers. Those waivers are potentially problematic, and that's something we also have addressed with the California Department of Justice and the OAL uh, before, uh, or at least in our letter. Uh, but it also requires you to create an account in that system, provide an email address, and then get to your security thing as most um, Internet websites do before you can create an account. Uh, but in order to register your firearm as an assault weapon, as you mentioned before, or as I mentioned before, the legislature made a whole bunch of information that you needed to provide to DOJ before your firearm can be in a, a registered as an assault weapon, and it's that, those um, black uh, font above. What DOJ is adding or extending to the requirements is all of the bottom information and below. And so what DOJ is doing is going beyond the information that the legislature is requesting to register your firearm uh, and making up an additional set of criteria for you to provide prior to registration of your firearm. And as you may note um, or may believe, and actually the driver's license and the ID card number is one that's required before. I apologize for that. But as you may recognize, a lot of those questions in red um, have to do directly from the 4473 form. In other words, this is the same information they request from you in order to do a background check. And that's exactly what they will be doing on you uh, when they process your assault weapon application. Oh, why they're going to be going about that process and, um, and doing that remains to be seen. But that is why they're asking for that information in red. Um, and that is the intent of that is to do at the time of application, they will be also doing a background check on the um, purchaser. And I do see the question relating to pictures, and that one's coming up. As for the firearm, and keep in mind that previous information is related to you, as for the firearm, DOJ is asking for additional information, and it's all that information um, we have right there. And again, uh, the information referenced in black um, is from the previous, um, or is, is rather straightforward. And again, the questions relating to the date the firearm was acquired and from whom or when or, or how that firearm was acquired, again, has potential problems if the answer to those questions may incriminate you. And so if you have any questions on how that firearm was received or concerns about how that firearm was received and whether or not it was okay for you to have received it in that fashion under California law, I would dare say you discuss that with an attorney before trying to register because, again, if you acquired that firearm that meets the definition of a weapon now, from Pookie down the street without going through a licensed firearm dealer and you say, I acquired this firearm on December 31st from Pookie on the corner of First and Elm, um, you got yourself a bit of a problem. And so and be very careful about that information and what DOJ is going to do if you don't know that information remains to be seen. Um, but in addition to the firearm um, information, yes, uh, you guys have asked before whether or not there are pictures required. Uh, you may know that answer already. According to DOJ, yep. Uh, they're insisting that you provide four, quote unquote, clear digital photos of the firearm. Um, what that means and uh, what exactly are the requirements of that remains to be seen, and I'll touch that in a second. But nevertheless, um, they want one photo of the uh, bullet button style device. They want one photo of the firearm from front to back, or um, muzzle to the end, and then two photos of the right and left sides of the receiver. So one side is the right side, flip the firearm over, there is the left side. But what that actually means remains to be seen because 
what exactly DOJ means by quote unquote clear photos um, is anybody's guess because the font or format, I should say, uh, of the photographs, um, are, do they want GIFs, do they want PDFs, how big, do they want gigabyte sized photos, do they want megabyte sized photos. Um, keeping also in mind that we're going to require you to not only have a digital camera and put them into the computer and then send them as attachments to your registration, and a lot of people don't know how to do that. Um, what they want and how they want it depicted remains to be seen, because if we got four pictures down below, uh, the first two are the, is, is that the right and left side of the receiver? And on the one on the far right, well, I got a picture of the front end of my firearm all the way to the end of my firearm. Um, is that sufficient? And what do they want in the background uh, of those firearms? They want is having the firearm uh, taken, the, the picture of the firearm taken at midnight, okay? What about on black construction paper? What about on other types of clever backgrounds that you all may be thinking of as we go through this? Uh, what, what all those things mean? What exactly is a clear picture? And keep in mind, if the, fire, the picture is not clear, our friends at DOJ have reserved the right to kick the registration back at you and say, no, you haven't provided some, uh, sufficient information. You need to resubmit uh, within the next 30 days or resubmit completely a brand new application. And so all, what all these requirements are still is up in the air and remains to be seen. Um, but in moving forward and in the application process, we get a lot of people asking questions and have had a lot of people ask questions about joint registration. Um, California, the code allows for joint registration of assault weapons, and that code section is reprinted right in front of you. You do have the option for joint registration for family members residing in the same household. Um, what the problem I have with what DOJ is coming up with is the following. And so if you want to jointly register assault weapons to the same members of your household, you have to identify one person as the primary registrant. And then at that point, you will need to name all of the other registrants and their relationship to that primary registrant. And of course, all of these people will need to be 18 years of age as of December 31st, 2017. But below are the only types of relationships DOJ will allow. So spouses, um, parents, children, children, parents, grandparents, grandchild, and going the other way, registered domestic partners, and siblings. Those are the only family dynamic DOJ contemplates for purposes of registering assault weapons for same people in your household. What if my in-laws were living with me and I was the primary registrant? Well, sorry, in-laws, uh, we can't register my assault weapon to you, and if you were to be found in possession of my assault weapon without me being there, you can be charged with a felony. Um, and the, the other, this also begs the question, if I was the person who uh, purchased the firearm and the firearm is registered to me in the automated firearm system and say my wife tries to register the firearm as the primary registrant, what's going to happen? And that also remains to be seen. Um, and there are other questions about stepchildren and um, stepchild, stepchild, <laughs> stepchildren. Um, I would hope that stepchildren um, would be included in that definition, but again, it remains to be seen whether that type of family relationship would be extended to that. Say I have an infirm uncle who resides with us, uh, whether or not he, well, he but I can't be registered to the firearm in that instance. Um, and so that's also an area of concern and an area of question. Also keep in mind that in order for that joint registrant to have that assault weapon registered to them as well, they need to have an addition, an, a additional proof of address. And the only proof of address addresses that DOJ will accept, which will need to be attached to your application online, is one of the following, a CCW, a CNR uh, license, a utility bill specified there, uh, permanent, uh, military permanent duty station orders, uh, property deed, uh, resident hunting license, signed dated rental agreement, trailer certification title, DMV vehicle registration, and certificate of eligibility. And that's it. And so if, say, in this case, I had an 18-year-old son, um, which would be a 
rather uncomfortable and odd for me, um, but living with us, um, and he didn't have any of these proofs of ID, he would not be able to register that Asolopin in his name. And so again, without those registration proofs of address, you will not be able to register the firearm jointly to those other people who are members of your family. And I do see, and I have been seeing people needing to leave, and again, I apologize for the length of this webinar and how long it's taking. If you do need to drop out, uh, please um, feel free to circle back around or circle back around repeatedly to the California Department of Justice, I'm sorry, California Department of Justice, California Rifle and Pistol Association website for um, the copies of this webinar. Um, as you can see, I'm 45 of uh, 59 slides in. Uh, these slides go a little bit quicker than what I've discussed before. Um, but we'll keep on going um, and we'll keep on doing that stuff. I, and in preparing these slides, we also got a lot of questions about gun trust and how do we transfer or inherit firearms that meet the definition of an assault weapon. Um, keep in mind, if you've jointly registered the firearm as a Sullivan, those people who inherit the firearm provided they are joint registrants, meaning they have registered the firearm to them as assault weapons, you can continue to possess the firearm. However, say you have only one person who registered the firearm to them, um, and that person passes away, and then you have that firearm transferred to you you are still able to inherit that firearm. However, once you inherit it, provided, again, you are not jointly registered owner of it, you've got a very limited window with what you can do. And it's basically right there with the 90 days for assault weapons or 180 days for 50 BMG rifles if you registered those um, back in the 2000s. I didn't believe it was 2006. Uh, for BMG rifles, if you inherit one of those firearms, you can still acquire it, but you've got to do one of the four things. Render it permanently inoperable, sell it to a licensed firearm dealer who has a dangerous weapons permit, obtain a permit from the California Department of Justice to possess it, good luck, or get it out of the state. I would probably dare say the people watching this and listening to this, if you inherit a firearm that meets the definition of assault weapon, and you are not the registered owner of it, you are probably going to want to get it out of the state or sell it to a licensed firearm dealer. Um, the other two options, one of them is darn near impossible. Um, the other would be um, rendering it permanently inoperable, which usually doesn't sit well with people as, anyway. But regardless of how you inherit that firearm, if it's through a gun trust, whether it's through a will, or if the person passes away without any trust or will in place and you, by operation of a law, inherit that firearm, if it meets the definition of an assault weapon, you can still inherit it. You just can't have it in the state of California if it's not registered to you as an assault weapon. And so you're able to get it, just you're going to have to get it the heck out of here or do one of those other options in inheriting the firearm. And I see a lot of people thinking that gun trusts are going to allow them or some other inheritance vehicle would allow them to continue to possess an assault weapon in the state of California. But if that firearm is not registered to you as an assault weapon, you're not going to be able to possess it in the state of California and you're going to be very limited with respect to how to go forward. And again, like I mentioned before, the inheritance vehicle, whether it's a trust, whether it's a will, whether it's the person passing away without either one of those, but the, the firearm passes down to you and that firearm is an assault weapon and it's not registered to you as an assault weapon, you have four options. I just laid them out and what you can do and how you need to go about dealing with that firearm. Um, I did see a lot of questions relating to the 80% receivers. Well, we're here now. If you've made a firearm for yourself that now meets the new definition of a saw weapon, you're going to need to uh, ask DOJ to provide you with a serial number for that firearm. And so if you've built up a firearm that isn't registered to you, or I'm sorry, I should back that up. If you've acquired an, or you made yourself a firearm that didn't have the serial number applied to it by the licensed firearm dealer, and you've, for lack of a better phrase, built it up from an 80% receiver, you will need to apply to DOJ through this process in order to get the serial number and then put it onto the firearm. If you have previously made a 
80% or completed an 80% firearm and then currently in possession of it and whether or not the person who made the 80% already had a serial number on it or you already installed your own, that sh does not appear to be sufficient for this requirement. In other words, if the 80% manufacturer had slapped a serial number on it of their own, but nevertheless you acquired it as an 80% uh, receiver, meaning that you didn't go through a licensed firearm dealer, you were able to purchase the firearm directly yourself, and then you completed the firearm yourself, and it now meets the definition of a weapon, or you went about that process and already put a serial number onto that firearm, the way this regulation is written, in either one of those cases, you're going to need to apply to the California Department of Justice and have them provide you a new serial number that you're going to need to put onto that firearm. And DOJ mentions that you're going to have to have a, either an 07 manufacturer or somebody unlicensed put that serial number onto your firearm. But if you have the unlicensed person do that, you cannot leave that firearm with them. But once the serial number is on it, you're going to need to show, and when you register that firearm, a picture showing that that serial number was added onto it. But here's a couple of problems with that. DOJ specifies and states that you can give the firearm to an 07 manufacturer um, to install the serial number. And I know I'm blazing over that phrase. A 07 um, is a reference to the number designation for certain federal firearms licensees, and 07 is a firearm manufacturer under federal law. And so it's commonly referred to as somebody being an 07 uh, licensee or an 07 dealer or flat out 07. Uh, but DOJ is specifying that you will need to take that firearm to a manufacturer to install the serial number. Well, there's a couple problems with that because you're giving them an assault weapon. If that 07 dealer doesn't have a dangerous weapons permit, uh, they got themselves a little bit of a problem if you leave that firearm with them. Also, under federal law, for purposes of engraving, you don't have to have an 07 license, a gunsmith or someone possessing an 01 license um, would be able to engrave that firearm uh, with the prerequisite serial number. And so why they're requiring you to go and find out an o find an 07 manufacturer for a firearm that you yourself have assembled and possess remains to be seen. Um, also, DOJ is saying that unlicensed party may apply the serial number. Well, that process is gunsmithing. And so if somebody is engaged in the business and dealing in gunsmithing, uh, I'm sorry, engaged in the business of gunsmithing, they need to have a federal firearms license in order for them to do that. And so for DOJ to tell you it's A-OK -okay to just go any unlicensed person and have somebody whip a serial number on that, that's potentially problematic. And again, that's something we point out to uh, DOJ, uh, but whether or not they're going to get that or clarify that remains to be seen. Uh, but for the manufacturers out there, don't get left with an assault weapon, and um, engraving that thing on there is uh, partly at the least of your worries and concerns, because the engraving, for those of you who own and possess an 80% receiver that you've built up to the firearm, has to meet the federal standards of engraving it. Um, onto that firearm. This language was stolen directly from the federal code, and the minimum depth and size requirements are directly parallel to what is actually required to a full-blown importer or manufacturer of firearms, um, and it's going to be what you're subject to for printing or engraving or casting or stamping that serial number that DOJ gives you onto that firearm. Additionally, DOJ wants more information put onto that firearm before it can be properly registered. And it's in addition to the serial number that you're going to be requesting, and it's all of that down below in red as well. And so all of that additional information, although it doesn't have specific height or depth requirements, it still needs to be uh, conspicuous and not susceptible, susceptible to being removed or altered. Uh, but they're going to require all of that inf additional information from you, and as I point out bottom and below, this goes even beyond what good old Senator De Leon was pushing for the ghost gun bill. All of this additional information isn't required under the ghost gun bill. All of 
that is required is the serial number. So why DOJ and how DOJ is going beyond those requirements is anybody's guess. Uh, but nevertheless, they are deciding to make people who want to register their firearms as assault weapons and who have made these firearms up themselves go through this process um, that is more onerous and more vigorous uh, than the actual ghost gun bill remains to be seen. Um, but that is what DOJ is coming up with requirement rise for purposes of those who have um, made their own firearms from 80% and are choosing to register their firearms as assault weapons. So before you can register your firearms, you will need to go through that process of asking for a serial number, having that provided to you by DOJ, and then going through the process of uh, engraving or in, uh, installing that serial number onto the firearm in addition to all of that other information, taking a picture of that sucker, and including that with your registration. Uh, I see a question relating to uh, are the requirements only apply to assault weapons and not California compliant rifles? Correct. So these requirements relate to uh, those of you who want to register your firearms as assault weapons this year. They don't, these requirements do not apply to, um, uh, to California compliant firearms. However, the ghost gun requirements do. And so if you build up your firearm from an 80% uh, receiver and you want to register it as an assault weapon, you will need to, at least for the time being or the way it's written here, abide by the requirements DOJ is putting forth here. You will still need to, if you don't go through these requirements and the firearm isn't an assault weapon, need to go through the ghost gun requirements, as I mentioned in the previous webinar, um, next year. And so one way or another, for 80% um, owners who have made up their own firearms, there's going to be a process by which you're going to need to request and then stamp onto your firearm and then potentially show to DOJ that you've put that serial number onto your firearm one way or another, I'm sorry to say. Um, the fees, as I mentioned before, those are 15 bucks. Um, no limit to number of assault weapons. Um, you can register per transaction, and the $15 fee is per transaction. So if you have one or 100 assault weapons you're registering, uh, with this great state of California, it's a $15 fee. Again, has to be paid by credit card. Um, and then if you want a copy, well, DOJ is going to ding you for those. Um, it's going to be 5 bucks a pop, but as I mentioned below, it's not going to be, and there are no requirements that you can't, or restrictions on you making multiple copies of your own. And I strongly suggest people who have um, already registered assault weapons under the past um, registration periods, if you haven't already, make multiple um, uh, copies of your assault weapon uh, registration. Um, and so there's those areas of concern. Um, the process, sometime relatively soon, I would expect, the application process will open for registering assault weapons. It will close December 31st. DOJ will need to have received those registrations on or before December 31st. So it would appear that DOJ would still be accepting registrations as of December 31st. I'd strongly advise you not to wait, though, because if DOJ were to kick or say you need further information um, in those registrations, you would probably want the sufficient time to correct those uh, registrations and get that information to DOJ or resubmit before December 31st. So do not wait to the last minute. Despite the fact that I'm saying it appears that you can register them on December 31st, or submit them for DOJ's approval on December 31st. Don't wait once that window opens. If you're choosing to do that, I would suggest going about doing that. And uh, that's also in addition to any and all potential challenges that we or anybody else may be making uh, for these laws. Um, the decision is yours to be moving forward uh, on registration, but uh, that application window, according to the regulations, opens and then shuts. December 31st. And if your application is incomplete, I mentioned it before, DOJ will send it back to you saying, hey, you're missing this information, your pictures are blurry, I don't know. You'll have an opportunity to fix those, um, uh, but during that, during that 30 day, if you fail to do that, then you will need to submit a new application um, to DOJ. So if DOJ is asking for additional information, correcting information, uh, you will have a 30-day window to correct that. Um, 
and resubmit. If you fail to do that, then you would just have to resubmit a brand new application um, after that point. Uh, and here's where I mentioned before, in processing the applications, DOJ will be doing a background check on the individual, at least that's what the regulations say that they're going to do in association with the registration process. And so um, again, if you have any questions, not only about the information you are going to be providing to DOJ, uh, whether or not it's potentially questionable, if you have questions about your eligibility status and whether or not you can lawfully possess firearms, you should strongly, I am strongly caution you to do that before um, submitting the application because again, much like those who are going to be unfortunate to register firearms that DOJ will have considered you needing to have registered prior to this point, like a Colt AR-15 or Colt Sporter, uh, DOJ might come a knocking if you end up being prohibited from owning and possessing firearms and you try to register an assault weapon with DOJ, I will I would expect law enforcement at one point or another, um, as one person puts in the chat, uh, they're hosed. Uh, yes, no, they, I would expect law enforcement to show up and you'd have a substantial problem. Um, here's the question a lot of people have been asking about, <laughs> what can I remove the bullet button? And I apologize for keeping it towards the end. That's just how the regulations were written and I kind of just did this linear. According to DOJ, you are prohibited from changing the release mechanism for the ammunition feeding device on any assault weapon registered under these regulations. So the question that has repeatedly been asked, can I remove the bullet button according to California Department of Justice? That answer is no. As far as we are concerned, that is something we will potentially be looking at rather strongly as and by way of challenge. Our letter lays it out, the one that we sent to both OAL and DOJ, and DOJ's position that you cannot remove the bullet button once it's registered. Uh, the restriction does not apply to repair or like-kind replacements, although where you're going to find a bullet button 10 years from now remains to be seen. Um, or if you go through the process of deregistering the firearm, and in deregistering the firearm, if you're going to remove the bullet button and have all of the other mean, nasty features attached to it, that firearm better, uh, better no longer be in the state of California. Um, but at least for DOJ is concerned, the answer to your question, can I remove the bullet button once I've registered the firearm, DOJ's response to that answer, or that question is a no according to this regulations. However, there were additional questions relating to people uh, of whether or not they can make any additional modifications. I would just say to that, uh, potentially sure. Can you add, modify, or remove stocks? Why not? Um, you have a registered assault weapon in that situation. DOJ is specifying you can't remove the bullet button. Whether or not you go from a uh, standard, um, uh, I, I guess a, a firearm that has a muzzle brake to one that has a flash suppressor once it's registered as, as an assault weapon, I dare say there's no issue with that or adding or removing a forward pistol grip or um, going from a solid stock to a collapsible one once that bullet button firearm is registered as an assault weapon. There is no restriction according to DOJ with respect to the adding or removing of those features. Again, always look out for the grenade launcher. Um, and don't do anything to make your firearm illegal, I dare say, by adding or removing parts that would cause it to be too short. And certainly don't install things like auto sears. Um, again, grenade launchers or cause a firearm to meet a federal restriction like in any other weapon. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, and as far as the regulations specify for purposes of registered assault weapons under these new laws, removal of the bullet button is a no-no, uh, but modification of the firearm any other way appears to be a, a viable option as in adding or removing features um, for that firearm. And so in moving forward and getting us, I dare say, to our last uh, regulation um, having to do with the voluntary deregulation of a firearm, you may, once a firearm is registered to you as an assault weapon, quote unquote, deregister it. This is actually existing law as well. 
If you were to move outside the great state of California uh, with a currently registered assault weapon, you may notify DOJ, hey, DOJ, I got this gun outside the state of California. Please unregister it as an assault weapon because I will never come back to this great state with this firearm or ever again anyway. Um, that process is in existence already in California law, and you do have the ability, if you have the firearm or you remodify it so it no longer meets the definition of a assault weapon, you, can, you may also re, or, um, unregister that firearm as an assault weapon. And so there is a process for which you did, or in which you need to do that. It's laid out here below. Um, so if you sold the firearm, you're going to need to show proof of sale. You're also going to need to provide a bunch of personal information. Um, if the firearm has been modified, um, you're going to have to show and provide additional information relating to what that firearm now looks like and why it no longer meets the definition of a solop. And, um, and then at that point, once DOJ's concerns are addressed, um, they will delete that firearm uh, from you as an assault weapon, um, depending on whether or not you've sold it as no longer in possession or it's no longer considered an assault weapon in the state of California. Um, wow, um, we are going right up into two hours, um, and that was a lot of talking. Um, as Chuck mentioned very, very early into this phone call, and I appreciate all of you, and we haven't had hardly any drop-off um, from those of you who have stuck around this entire time, um, we will probably be doing a further write-up concerning these laws uh, that we will um, be putting out through NRA and CRPA. Again, what is going to happen with this stuff, I apologize, but it still remains to be seen. Um, because again, these are and have been proposed with the Office of Administrative Law, OAL, and they aren't published and they aren't California law yet. And so at that point, uh, what they're going to do and what OAL is going to do, and in light of our letter to both OAL and DOJ, what's going to happen with these laws remains to be seen. And, but nevertheless, NRA and CRPA will um, be on top of it. We will be letting you know. Um, I'm sure all of you are here partly because of the alerts and information that we put out saying that these laws, um, or that we're going to do a webinar on these laws, and these laws have been proposed. Uh, when will a fifth edition of this book come out? Um, probably again in November. It will have everything under the sun as it relates to these new laws. I, I'm sorry to say that the fourth edition that you're looking at right now does not have these new regulations in it. It does have um, all of Prop 63 and the laws that passed back in July, but unfortunately both the large cap mag stuff and these new regulations came out after the book was published. Um, thank you for those of you who already purchased the book. Um, and again, we will be putting out information, further information relating to these laws um, as they slowly trickle out. And of course, I see a lot of questions relating to challenges. And like I said already, and as Chuck has mentioned before, um, there is, um, uh, we are already looking at and already contemplating challenges not only to this, but a number of the other laws that were passed. Um, back in July, and of course Newsom's initiative that I, I apologize I can't go into detail uh, on, uh, partly because it's attorney-client privilege, partly because we don't want to tip our hand because as we mentioned before, I am certain that there are representatives uh, from the California Department of Justice, um, other uh, law enforcement uh, entities and agencies, and I dare say probably um, people from the other side of the um, firearm tracks would be very interested in how and why we would challenge a number of these laws. Um, and moving forward, um, I think we have a couple of just last slides. Um, keep in mind that we will probably be doing upcoming webinars for these and other topics. Uh, moving forward, there are already webinars for the bottom topics on CRPA's website. Um, and again, I appreciate all of you sticking through this um, and listening to me drone on for an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, I have to apologize for the great state of California um, and you having to sit through this stuff because most people in 59 or 49 other states don't have uh, these areas of concern um, that have to worry about. Um, questions, uh, please feel free to forward those to the California Rifle and Pistol Association. Um, again, we received and we solicited questions over 300 questions. Um, I dare say we probably addressed, and I hope we addressed, 
um, a lot of the questions that you have here today. I'll tell you guys what, uh, and the troopers who have buried with me, um, for those of you who have additional questions, I will stay on for another 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, fire them off in chat. I will try to answer them as quickly um, and as succinctly as I possibly can. Um, uh, as we go through here, I saw a question relating to 80%. If you have it as a feature list build, will you need to register it as an assault weapon? No, pursuant to these regulations, but keep in mind uh, the, um, the ghost gun restrictions will come into place. And so if you have a firearm that does not meet the definition of an assault weapon um, under these or any of the old new uh, laws for that matter, um, and you built it up yourself, you will not need to register it um, as a assault weapon, obviously not abide by these registration requirements, but the ghost gun restrictions and requirements uh, will face you. Uh, you guys are asking a lot of questions. Let me slow this down. Um, uh, Ruger 1022s and rimfire uh, rifles still not considered assault weapons because, again, for the rifle requirements, needs to be center fire. Um, so if you have yourself a rimfire firearm, it does not meet the definition of assault weapons. Um, transportation of bullet button guns prior to registration, I would still suggest transporting those firearms um, as I, well, I would typically tell people to transport them in locked containers and unloaded anyway, uh, just to prevent any other areas of concerns uh, that a person in law enforcement may have stumbling across those firearms. I'd still suggest doing that as well. Um, uh, the AR maglock, I did mention that before. Uh, the devices that people are currently touting uh, as being replacements to the bullet button appear to, depending on how those locks function, uh, suffice for purposes of rendering a firearm to have a fixed magazine. And so if you cannot remove the magazine while that firearm is fully assembled, and if for the AR platform you have to tilt that upper receiver up, and the only way for you to remove that magazine using that magazine release mechanism is to um, have that upper receiver tilted up and that's the only way that magazine release mechanism would function. That should suffice for purposes of the fixed magazine uh, restriction uh, requirement. Um, does the bullet button itself um, cause, with no other features, make an AR-15 and a assault weapon? I, I would dare say no. If you have yourself a semi-automatic centerfire rifle, either with a bullet button or even if it has the capacity to accept a detachable magazine, um, that firearm should not be considered an assault weapon based on its features. Again, if the firearm is make model prohibited, you got yourself a problem. And if it's got, um, if it's less than 30 inches in length, you potentially have yourself a problem. Um, strip lower receivers bought in 2016. Um, if you've bought yourself a strip lower receiver now or um, in 2017, those those receivers themselves do not meet the definition of a firearm, let alone an assault weapon. However, you're going to be limited into how you build that firearm up now into, um, and, and into what configuration. I dare say at this point you're going to be precluded from um, completing that firearm into a configuration that causes it to meet a, a, an assault weapon now that needed to be done according to the regulation in DOJ prior to January 1st. So if you're building up an AR an 80% now, you will not be able to put it into an, an assault weapon, quote unquote, configuration at this point. Um, but if you're going through an 80% um, and if you have a featureless gun, meaning one that does not need to be registered as an assault weapon, you may still do so. But remember, and please review that other webinar I did on ghost guns, uh, for those of you who are doing and completing 80% after January 1st, 2017, you're not going to be able to complete it in an assault weapon, quote unquote, configuration, but you'll still probably need to go through the process to request and get a serial number added to that, um, that firearm under the ghost gun laws. Um, those of you who want to get your firearm outside of the great state of California and keep it there, um, we get that question a lot. Yeah, you should be able to do that. And so if you're going to have a firearm that meets the current definition or the new definition, I should say, of assault weapon this year, um, 
one of the potential options, I dare say, would have that firearm stored and possessed outside of the state of California, keeping in mind it's going to need to stay there um, as long as it meets the definition of assault weapon. Um, if you were to reconfigure that firearm in the California compliance or quote-unquote featureless configuration, uh, you may be able to bring it back, but uh, that is potentially one way to avoid the registration process is to go about and, um, and um, have the firearm stored outside the state of California. Uh, no, the uh, serialization process for 80% is not the same thing as registration. You will need to get the serial number put onto that firearm first and then register it as an assault weapon. And DOJ is specific in that uh, regard when it comes to the registration requirements. They will not accept registrations for firearms and individuals made him or herself without going through the serial number first. Um, thanks, you guys, for the other thank yous. Um, pump action shotguns with collapsible stocks um, and pistol grips, um, assault weapons, no. Um, because remember, for shotguns and for most firearms, in order to meet the definition of an assault weapon, it needs to be semi automatic. So, pump action is not semi automatic. Yeah, um, people who have engraved 80% and put their own serial number onto that firearm, according to the way the um, the DOJ has written the regulations, it appears that you're going to have to ask for a separate serial number directly from them that they're going to give you um, for you to be able to register it. The fact that you've put on your own serial number and made up your own serial number designation will appears not to suffice for what these regulations will require. Um, if you've been in possession of a firearm um, and you want to remove all of the evil features that would cause the firearm to meet the definition of assault weapon under these existing laws, I dare say that would be sufficient because the firearm then at that point is not a quote-unquote assault weapon. If it doesn't have the mean nasty features on it, it is not considered an assault weapon, so therefore um, it should not need to be registered in the state of California as an assault weapon. Um, no, a stripped AR lower receiver, and I dare say even a, an AR um, assembly, uh, I'm sorry, an AR receiver assembly, the lower assembly, um, even if it's completely put together, stock and everything should not be considered an assault weapon. Like I mentioned before, if the firearm is not functioning and the upper is removed from the lower, the firearm is not considered to be semi-automatic. If the firearm is not considered to be semi-automatic, it can't be considered an assault weapon. And so if you have in the lower an assembly, that in and of itself will not be considered an assault weapon. I dare say the same thing with a strip receiver and the same thing with just an 80% receiver sitting there. Uh, are those who have received undetermined doses uh, going to be able to register as assault weapons? If you haven't received your firearm before January 1st, uh, 2017, because you're still waiting on a DROS, um, the DOJ was rather specific in their requirements saying that you had to be in possession of that firearm prior to January 1st, 2017. Um, and so if the firearm is in a, an assault weapon configuration, that dealer has him or herself, herself a bit of a problem. Um, and if that firearm was converted over to be quote unquote California compliant um, in light of the New Year's laws um, and transferred to you, you would not and should not try to register that firearm as an assault weapon, I'm sorry to say. Uh, DOJ will probably kick it. Uh, the registration process for registering assault weapons is not currently open. Again, the, reg the regulations that DOJ has come up with for purposes of registration um, has not um, been submitted um, by DO the Office of Administrative Law to the Secretary of State. I'm trying to read these as quick as possible. Uh, those of you who have registered assault weapons under the um, old designations and they are registered to you as assault weapons, um, you will not need to, and I dare say, um, DOJ and their regulations will actually refuse registration under these new regulations. Um, it goes back to one of the uh, regulations I mentioned before um, that DOJ will not um, 
register firearms that meet the old definitions of assault weapons when, if, or that were required to be registered previously. And so those of you who have registered assault weapons right now and went through the process to register those firearms as assault weapons and have did, or if you have done so in the past, you will not need to re-register now. Um, that's actually a good question. Why the heck you would need a featureless gun with a bullet button? Uh, you, you shouldn't, <laughs> but nevertheless, um, there, there's people asking that question, and so there you go. Um, Um, there are no requirements to notify DOJ if you take a firearm outside the state of California um, at all. Um, that firearm will, if it's acquired from a licensed firearm dealer and depending on when that firearm was acquired and if it's a long gun, they may or may not have record of you acquiring that firearm. Um, but there's no requirement to notify DOJ that you're taking the gun outside of the state of California. Um, as far as we're concerned, where it relates to grip wraps and fin grips, DOJ has not modified or tweaked the definition of pistol grip to preclude those. And so as far as we're concerned, the installation of uh, quote unquote grip wraps and fin grips, um, if you're referring to those devices that prevent you from wrapping your thumb around the um, pistol grip of a um, AR or AK type firearm, thus having the webbing of your Thumb, I'm sorry, the webbing of your hand between the thumb and forefinger, and I'm butchering that and I apologize, um, above the uppermost exposed portion of the trigger, um, those should suffice and not meet the definition of pistol grip. Uh, DOJ, as far as we're aware, has not modified that. Um, it's a rather um, broad question, because, but because both of you guys asked um, back to back, uh, mini 14s uh, and mini 30s. Uh, should still not meet the definition of an assault weapon provided uh, those firearms are still what I would consider in a rifle type configuration, meaning that they are still semi-automatic, they are still center fire, they have in most intents and purposes the capacity to accept a de detachable magazine, let alone a fixed magazine, but they have no additional features. Um, usually those firearms in are, are rather in a quote-unquote rifle-style configuration with no other mean nasty features, meaning, for example, pistol grip forward, pistol grip, um, a thumb hole stock, and things like that. If those firearms are in standard rifle configurations, they still would not be considered a sultan. Um, I actually didn't mean to mix up stripped and unfinished um, because a stripped lower receiver and even an unfinished lower receiver would not be considered an assault weapon. Um, an unfinished receiver would not be considered a quote unquote firearm while a stripped receiver would. Um, but thank you for pointing out um, the designation on uh, the, I'm um, sorry, the um, distinction between those. Okay, I'm getting really far behind on the questions, guys. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to answer questions for a couple more minutes if I can possibly get through these as quickly as I possibly can. Um, the installation of an air maglock now um, should suffice for the firearm not meeting the definition of assault weapon. It should not need to be registered now, provided, that, again, that, that firearm does not meet the definition of assault weapon for any other reasons. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the Thorsden stock still appears to be a stock that does not have, I'm sorry, does not cause the firearm to have a pistol grip. Um, again, DOJ has not altered the definition of pistol grip to the point where I would say it includes those types of stocks. Um, is taking a featured AR-15 apart for cleaning and repairing it um, before registration allowed? I, I would dare say yes. 
Um, despite the fact that the exception applies for possession, um, that should still be an activity that is um, allowed for purposes of possessing an assault weapon. Uh, can one or more assault weapon registration uh, be submitted? Yeah, you, uh, according to, although we haven't seen the forms as they've been published yet for, uh, by DOJ, according to the regulations, you can register multiple um, assault weapons in one transaction. And so it could be one or more than one assault weapon can be registered at a time. But again, the, the window for us to do that has not yet opened. Uh, yes, if you have a registered assault weapon and you take it outside the great state of California, you don't need to notify DOJ, but if you'd want that thing out of your name and taken out of um, you as registered as a assault weapon, you may, but if you were to do so, you wouldn't be able to bring it back. Okay, guys, I'm going to cut it off there. Um, my voice is rather fried. I apologize to all of you who had different uh, additional questions. Uh, for just not being able to get to you. Um, and like Chuck mentioned, we're not going to be able to address a lot of these. We will provide um, additional information. If you have personal questions that you are seeking answers to, um, and present those to the CRPA. Um, they can be the clearinghouse for us for those. Or if you want to contact our office directly, I apologize. We cannot do all of these questions. I'd be answering questions uh, until next June. Um, and so if you're looking to have specific and individual questions addressed, we can do that. Um, but typically when we have those questions uh, addressed to our office, I, I apologize, but we do require a nominal fee. Um, but we will be providing additional information on these subjects um, as they come out, as DOJ changes them, as I dare say our challenges come out to them. Um, but for the time being, um, guys, I'm going to take a long drink of water uh, and break for lunch. Uh, but I hope you all the best. Stay safe out there. Um, keep informed, and I most certainly will be talking to you uh, in the foreseeable future. Take care, everybody. Bye.